How can you redeem yourself from committing illegal parallel fifths? That's what we're going to talk about today during Dr. Doug's Daily Tips for how to write great LDS church music. To help us, we're going to use Hymn 135, My Redeemer Lives, lyrics by President Gordon B. Hinckley, and music by, let's see, Gordon, uh, sorry, sorry, G. Homer Durham. I always think of this as the President Hinckley hymn. Okay, so what happens here? <clears throat> There's actually a big, fat no-no, which they get away with in this hymn, and we're going to talk about why they get away with it. In this opening passage, I know that my Redeemer, right on the word Redeemer, we have a bad no-no error. Look at the left hand. We have a perfect fifth, this G and D going to another perfect fifth in parallel motion. Ah, parallel fists. This is no, no, no. Now, parallel fists do occur in some types of music, and they're fine in that type of music. However, in traditional hymn writing, they're a no-no. They destroy the resonance that hymns are trying to create. Unless you can sneak out of them, and that is what happens here. So normally when you're looking at a passage like this and you're thinking, hmm, I've got parallel fifths. What am I supposed to do? Well, you try adding a bunch of different chords in there. For example, instead of using this setup here, which is the six chord, we have the one chord going to the six chord. Well, they could have gone, they could have stayed on the one chord. They could have done G, B, D, G. That would work. Okay, that works. Or they could have done the one six and gone way down here to a B. That works too. No problem. Works very, really, really well. And a uh, nice motion in the bass. They could have gone to a 6-7. This might have been the smoothest because we would have kept an E there and gone to a D here and kept these notes. Keeping the D. Very smooth. The tenor holds the same thing, but they didn't do that. Uh, even though it works, <clears throat> they could have done a 4-6. So a 4-6 would be a C major chord with E in the bass. <clears throat> that also works. They could have done a 6 chord in first inversion, which would keep the G in the bass right there. not my favorite but it works and it doesn't have a parallel fifth in it and one other one that they could have done is the 464 which keeps the G in the bass and goes to that same C major chord but now with G in the bass those all work they all have a slightly different flavor and you might like one over the other. So if you were writing an arrangement of this, you could pick that one over this one. But why did they stick with this? It's a good question. I don't actually know their reasoning, but I have a guess. <clears throat> My guess would be that they liked that sound of the minor six going from Redeemer to the word lives. Because when you think Redeemer lives, that means, well, he was dead. And now he's going to resurrect, right? And so to have some sort of harmony depiction of death and resurrection, I believe, is why they chose the six chord there on, on the deem of Redeemer, because it's minor. And we get that minor sound that then rises to the major chords next. Minor, death, and resurrection. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's why they did it, but you know, I'm only guessing because I didn't, I don't know them, um, and 
I know President Hinckley's not alive, and Brother Durham is probably not alive either. Now, why does that work? It works because the one chord and the six chord share notes. And one absolutely brilliant way out of parallel fifths is to use what we call oblique motion. Oblique motion is when one voice stays the same. It does not change. The notes stay the same while the other voice moves. Okay? <clears throat> if you zoom way in, you see the bass is moving down. But this voice up here, even though it's the alto going to the soprano, we get the sense of oblique motion. Now, this is not perfectly oblique motion because it's hopping voices, but in our ear, because the one chord and the six chord are almost exactly the same chord, there's only one note different, the E, we hear only the bass motion. Everything else in that chord is like hearing part of the G chord. It's only the bass... Excuse me, the alto does move as well, <clears throat> which is a parallel octave with the bass. But still, that G going from alto to soprano, it sort of covers their sins because of the sound of that common tone. Okay, so the theory teacher in me still kind of gets a little shivery <laughs> here because this is pretty blatant parallel fifth parallel octave. I would certainly not write this myself, and I would probably grade your paper wrong if you did this. However, in this instance, it kind of does work. It depicts that minor major thing with the six going back to the five and the one, the minor to the major, and it covers the sin of the of the blatant parallel sound because of the common tone G in the women's voices. Even though it's not alto to alto, it's alto to soprano that are keeping the common tone. That's what pulls it off here. It covers it with that sound. So here's a very sneaky way to redeem yourself from the death of illegal parallel fifths and octaves. Do it between the one and the six and make sure something <clears throat> is staying common and you might just get away with it. I think the other reason this one works uh, and it doesn't stand out as this nasty illegal parallel is because it's so quick. The addition of the oblique and the quickness of it pretty, pretty well covers it. Well, that is your composer gem for today. If you enjoyed that, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell and share it with your friends. And let me know in the comments what other things would you like me to create so that I can help you with your writing of great LDS church music. And if you'd like more free tips, head over to latterdaymusicversity.com where you can get a bunch more. See you next time.